So welcome everybody and um, thanks for joining in this second webinar on the course of introducing computing in your classroom. My name is Nair Carrera and I'm here with my colleagues Tomas and Tomislava. We work in European Schoolnet in projects related to coding and digital skills. And today we're here hosting this webinar where we will be listening to Patrick Finney talking about why it is important to include mobile apps in your teaching. He will also show us uh, different tools and resources so that you can try this in your classroom with your children. And he will show up like different examples. So before we start, we're going to ask you to mute your microphone so that we don't hear any background noises. Sometimes we will mute, uh, we will mute you too. We don't want to be rude, but we need to do that in order to hear everything properly. And if you want to intervene or ask a question at any point, just raise your hand. You have this icon here on the left of the screen in front of the audio button. You can raise your hand or maybe just post a question in the chat, which will be mostly the best way to, to ask a question. I have seen that some of you have already written where are they from. The others, if you haven't shared with, with us this information, feel free to do it. We'll be very happy to know where you are coming from. Uh, also, just to let you know that this webinar will be recorded and you will be able to, to see it in section 3.5 on the course. Uh, so, so for the practicalities now, let me quickly introduce you to Patrick Finney. So Patrick has an educational background in physics and he has taught maths and physics in international schools in New York, Sofia, Antipolis or Honolulu before he became an educational game designer. Then he has been involved in tech industry for many years and he has participated in different educational technology ventures including video games and educational apps. He is currently living in Brussels now and he has founded the Digital Job Brussels and he also leads the Code Tojo Ederbeck, which is a programming club for kids between 8 and 18 years old. And he's also doing some consult consulting work here in European Schoolnet where he works for the Future Classroom Lab by training teachers in the use of classroom tools for robotics, coding and creative computing. I hope this presentation is right, Patrick. If if it's not, just feel free to correct me or <laughs> or no, add anything you, you you consider appropriate. That's fine, Nair. Thank you. Okay, so we hand it over to you. We give you the presentations right now. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you. Fantastic. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Nair. Uh, I um, welcome everybody to this webinar on making mobile apps uh, in schools. Uh, I think uh, everybody has been watching the videos this week uh, in the computing course about visual programming languages, Scratch, making video games in Scratch, making animations with Scratch, robotics. I'm here to tell you about the opportunities for creating mobile apps in, in your classroom uh, and to try and convince you that it's uh, an effort worth, worth making. So why create mobile apps when we have tools such as Scratch that everybody likes uh, that seem to work well for, uh, for everyone? Uh, there are several reasons. Uh, first of all, mobile devices are everywhere. Uh, uh, kids use mobile devices from a very young age. They uh, continue to use them and they always seem to have a mobile device in their hand and yet they don't know how uh, these mobile devices really work, how they're programmed, how the apps that they use function, how the apps are delivered to the app store, um, how um, people who develop apps uh, make um, software that works with the camera that they use uh, when they Skype, that works with the, the microphone, with the keyboards that they use. So um, I think it's very important to educate kids uh, in this age to how the devices that they use in their daily lives function. Um, the other nice thing about using mobile apps to teach computing is that you are tapping into uh, skills that the kids already have. The kids already have a comfort level with apps. Um, they don't all want to make video games in Scratch. They don't all want to design a website, uh, which is something else you can, uh, you can do to teach 
um, programming skills. Uh, however, most kids would say if you offered to them to make mobile apps for uh, for their for their phone, uh, they would say that that's something that's very interesting because it connects with something they already know about. They do use um, uh, their devices in sophisticated ways and um, uh, by making them do apps that already do the things that they use their phones to do, uh, you're proposing something to them that, um, that connects very well with, uh, with what they're, they're already interested in and they're used to doing. Uh, mobile apps also have a usefulness that other things don't have. When you uh, tell somebody that they're going to make um, a, a robot move, when you tell somebody that they're going to do some hour of code activities, they don't always um, get excited about sharing those activities with, with others. But making an app that allows you to look up lyrics uh, for popular songs on, um, on your phone and being able to then share that app with other, uh, with other young people is something that is definitely exciting to them. Uh, I live in Brussels where we have um, at least two languages and a lot of kids actually don't understand each other. Uh, we gather kids to do programming workshops where they speak completely different languages and we have to use multiple languages. So uh, we have kids develop apps for translation that are extremely sophisticated and they can, they can right away see the usefulness of it because if you can speak to the phone and the phone can speak back to you uh, in the language of, uh, that the other kids are speaking, uh, it's, it's right away something that, um, that they feel is very useful and worth, worth sharing. Uh, you know, so generally, um, uh, the point I'm trying to get across is that apps uh, and mobile devices are something that kids have a, a real, a real attachment to, a real love for. Um, kids, kids, when you hand them a mobile phone, if you happen to have access to them, or a tablet device in your classroom, their eyes always light up. There's always uh, an, an excitement there. Um, I've seen kids react to them in ways that were really surprising. I, I did a programming workshop recently where we taught the students how to make voice triggered mobile apps and I got an email from a parent of one of the students the next day saying that their daughter who had never liked math class before, who would never liked anything that involves logic, is now asking to be signed up for an after school programming class. Uh, so uh, I think that there's ways to accomplish with making apps things that some of the other tools that you're seeing this week, such as robots and uh, visual programming languages like Scratch, uh, don't allow you to accomplish as effectively. Uh, so I will um, go into how students can make apps and how you can help them get on the road to, to developing apps uh, in, in just a second. But um, I wanted first to do a little tiny detour because it's early in the week and not everybody has looked at all the videos about visual programming languages, for instance. And I wanted to take a little detour and first talk to you about what a visual programming language is since most of the tools we're going to talk about require some programming. I think it's important to understand uh, visual versus text-based languages uh, before you can decide for yourself how appropriate the particular tools are for, uh, for your classroom. Uh, so uh, very, very briefly, we have visual languages that are often used for education. Uh, for instance, the image that, oh, I haven't been moving the slides, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, Forgive me for it's forgive okay. me for that. We were just wondering if everything was okay. <laughs> no, no, everything's fine. Technically, okay. technically, I was just moving the wrong slides on the uh, on the wrong page. Forgive me. I hope now everybody can uh, can follow. Uh, I was just doing a lot of talking anyway. Now it's going to get visual. In fact, okay. I'm talking about visual programming languages, uh, and I need images to show that. So, we have um, we have visual languages like the ones that you can see in this image that I'm displaying. On the left, you might have recognized as Scratch, where you drag colored blocks uh, of instructions for the computer to process into a stack. Uh, on the right, I don't know if you recognize it, but this is the, program, the programming language for Lego Mindstorms. Uh, this again is visual. You drag blocks in a sequence on the block is visual information that tells you what the instruction is. 
that you are uh, you are choosing for for the program. Uh, contrast that with a text-based language, which is a traditional professional programming language, and you can see that it's very different. This is much more intimidating. This is you would type this the way you type a natural language uh, using characters on a keyboard. With a visual language, you use the mouse a lot more. You drag, drop, and um, put uh, visual color-coded blocks in a, in a sequence. This is Scratch that I'm showing you right here. The result of the code on the right side is the animation on, on the left side. Uh, Patrick, just just a minute. Just uh, allow me to interrupt you just a little bit because I need to tell the participants that if they don't see the slides properly, they should go to view and then synchronize with presenter. Synchronize display with presenter because I am not sure if they are seeing the slides properly. Would you like to take the time to um, to see okay. if anybody posts a problem to the chat? Yes, I would like to see if, if somebody can, can can tell us if, okay, it's okay now. Okay, so just do this, if, if you, you should do this for any slide, view and synchronize with display, with the presenter. Thank you, sorry. Okay, great. Uh, I will um, I will keep, uh, keep moving. So we were talking about text-based languages versus visual languages. It's important to understand the, the difference. Uh, here you have, uh, categories of scratch blocks, each different color serves a different but similar purpose. So all the orange blocks are control blocks, all of the purple blocks control uh, the sounds in your program. Same thing with Lego Mindstorms, things are color coded because all the green blocks are action blocks that make the motors turn to activate the robot's functions, all the red blocks are data operations. Uh, for instance, when you want to do an addition, a multiplication, or work with a variable. And uh, visual languages clearly have a lot of advantage, which is why they're used so widely in schools. Here you can see how um, nicely scratch blocks stack together. Certain blocks don't stack on top of each other. They don't fit together, which indicates that you can't use those things together. So you avoid a lot of errors when you're programming in a visual programming language, and it's really the best way uh, for, uh, for young programmers to, to begin. Besides visual languages and professional text-based languages, you have hybrid languages. Today we're going to talk about one. What you're seeing on the, on the slide now is an image of touch develop which is an app development environment created by Microsoft. And what Microsoft did is they created a uh, mix of visual and text so that you can slide blocks of code like in Scratch, but at the same time you have to do quite a bit of typing. Uh, and it's a, it's a mix of, uh, of both things. So I think armed with that, uh, presentation on, um, on on visual versus text. I think we can go into the specific tools for making apps, uh, and you will understand much better uh, what tool is best for your, uh, for your teaching for your for your school. So the three tools that we're going to focus on uh, are App Inventor, uh, Microsoft Touch Develop, and Pocket Code. I'm going to start talking about App Inventor. App Inventor is really the most common tool for making apps with young students. Uh, I call it the scratch of app development because it's a free tool. It's developed and maintained at MIT, who are the people who make Scratch. Uh, and it's very commonly used, um, very easy to, to use, and um, it is really the um, most representative tool when uh, you're, you're discussing making apps with, uh, with young kids. Uh, we have, with App Inventor, something that doesn't necessarily require hardware. It doesn't need an Android device because there's a simulator that you can use to preview the apps that you make in App Inventor. Uh, so what you see on the screen is an online interface that allows you to program and create apps that are then tested in a little fake phone, a simulator. Um, and so you can see the results of what you're doing without even investing in any, in any hardware. 
Uh, however, it is much, much better if you do have access to Android smartphones or tablets, uh, either the students' Android phones, which is becoming more and more common that students have their own smartphones in their pockets with them at school, or uh, tablet or, or uh, smartphones that, um, that belong to the school that can be used in your, in your classroom. If you have a smartphone uh, that, you can, that you can use in your, in your classroom, then you can then test the apps that you make on the phone, which is not only much more exciting for, for your students, but also allows you to make programs that tap into the camera, the microphone, uh, all the hardware of the phone, which is where it really gets fun. You can have students make apps that use the, uh, the songs that, um, that are in the, the memory of the phone, uh, the browser of the phone, so they can go in and do Google searches. All of these things you could not do using the simulator that I was showing you on the previous slide. So Android devices are not a necessity, but uh, are really, really preferable. Um, I'd be curious to know how many people have access to tablet devices either smartphones uh, or tablet devices in, in their schools. And so I've, um, um, I would like, Nair, if you could, to... Yes, we, we're going we gonna to try to do it because Patrick has a very very question for you to answer. So we're going to share with you now this poll, and we're going to give you some time, just a few seconds. We reckon it will be enough so that you can, you can answer it, and then we will share the results with all of you. Can you see the poll, everybody? Yes. I can see the poll, Nair, but okay, great. I hope the participants can. Yeah, I think they can. Oh. I'm going to do the poll, too. Okay. We hope everybody has enough time to answer. We're going to close the poll now and we'll share the results with you. Okay. Okay, can you see it? Uh, I can see the results. Yeah, it's very interesting okay. that um, half um, half of you said you do not have access to to mobile devices in your in your schools in your classrooms. Only 31% answered that yes, uh, you you do have tablet or smartphones to use in your in, in your schools. Uh, well, um, the the tools that we are um, we're talking about tonight, uh, there's something for everybody. Uh, App Inventor is something that you can use without having a smartphone connected to it. Uh, and some of the other tools that we're going to discuss are, are also, uh, you're also able to use without necessarily having a, a smartphone. Uh, so let's move on and continue talking about App Inventor. Um, I, um, I really like the the tool and use it uh, whenever I do apps with uh, with kids because it's a lot like scratch you uh, it's very intuitive uh, the way you use it you can see the slide that I'm displaying now you drag uh, interface elements in other words buttons images uh, a video display screen onto an interface in the the editor in the um, the screen that you use to create apps, and then you drag colored blocks of code, a lot like in Scratch, to do the programming for, for the app. So a finished app, I'm going to go a few slides forward and then come back. Uh, this is a finished app. You can see in the background the blocks of code looks a lot like Scratch that was used to create the app that's on the phone. Once again, you could display the same app on the on the simulator. So stay on the 
the screen of the PC and not actually have to have a device to, to do the demo. Uh, but here they have a demo on a phone, and you can see that it's actually appropriate for, uh, for kids as young as, as nine. You can tell from the types of little toys that they've gathered. Uh, to do this uh, this activity. This is not one of my my activities, but I'm going to give you links to to things that I've done on the phone. Uh, so, uh, yeah, App Inventor is very easy to use, especially if uh, your students have seen Scratch. It's not identical to Scratch, uh, but it does uh, but it does help to have seen Scratch. They have a website like in Scratch where people display their projects, and you can upload your own. Uh, your own apps to uh, to the website and share your your work, so it's a bit of a social experience. Uh, and there's uh, these very clever flashcards that have been produced uh, by MIT and also by other people that allow young kids, even as young as this boy that uh, that you see in the image, to get started making quite powerful apps very very quickly. So it encourages experimentation. It's uh, it's very fast and intuitive and easy to get started. Uh, kids generally understand App Inventor uh, right away. Adults also like it. This uh, this slide didn't come through well, so I will uh, I will skip it. Uh, but um, more advanced um, uh, kids who are a little bit older uh, and uh, and also adults take to App Inventor. One complaint that I have all the time from the kids in my coding clubs is that Scratch looks a little too baby. They don't like that. So uh, App Inventor is a good uh, a good substitute. Uh, it feels more adult, and um, it feels more professional and more uh, and more powerful. I can I, I had a, a fantastic activity in a school recently where I took kids who had never coded before and never seen App Inventor before, and we created a mobile app that was voice triggered. You can see on the slide that's the voice recognition function in the Android phone, and we created an app that would draw circles of different colors and sizes. Uh, based on commands that you that you gave it, so it was quite a sophisticated app, and yet we were able to do it in 50 minutes with five consecutive groups of children. Uh, so just a classroom conditions in a school, uh, and the kids had never programmed before. So App Inventor allows you to do quite quite amazing things. I urge you to uh, to have a look at it. I've given you a link to the activity that I'm referring to. Uh, this is uh, the handout that we gave to each uh, each student, which allowed them to to be able to build this app very quickly. Uh, so, um, moving um, out of App Inventor, but very quickly, since we're talking about apps, I think it's important for me to uh, to take into consideration the the results of the poll, which say that most people don't have uh, mobile devices in their in their schools. Um, how can we maybe get uh, get a hold of some mobile devices, and uh, is it something that's going to become cheap and accessible very soon? Well, uh, Android uh, devices are becoming cheaper. Uh, we use $80 smartphones that are really very good and have a nice big screen. Um, I speak in uh, in dollars, but I should be saying euros. Although I bought these on a on a on a website. Uh, but um, the 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 number of phones in schools is is increasing, and thanks to thanks in part to people who are are making that happen, Google actually is quite generous. They hand out a lot of free phones to schools uh, in the U.S., the U.K., and now in Europe to make their virtual reality um, system called cardboard, which is the photo that you see function inside that that paper uh, frame is, a, is an Android smartphone, and they've been handing these out to schools quite generously because they want children to be able to experience going on museum trips without leaving the classroom, uh, going back in history and experience a virtual history class without leaving the classroom. They also have a program where they offer to schools and to um, programming clubs uh, free phones during EU Code Week every year in October, and uh, you can apply for, uh, for a grant. Uh, to uh, to buy phones to to work with uh, MIT App Inventor. I was able to do that recently and was and was awarded 17 uh, 17 phones for my programming club. So um, I hope that um, that App Inventor is going to be something that people can use more and more because uh, it's a, it's a really a fantastic tool and people talk about Scratch a lot, uh, but App Inventor I think is a is a very interesting alternative to Scratch or a continuation of Scratch. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit faster through the other um, the other tools that we're going to discuss. Microsoft Touch Develop, which is a very interesting tool, also, especially since uh, it allows you to make 
apps for all devices, not just Android. So with Touch Develop, you can, you can program online, and then you can see the results of your program, the app, um, either on the PC or on any tablet or smartphone device, not just Android, but also iPhone. The reason for this is that Touch Develop is a, uh, creates what's called a little web app, a uh, mini website of sorts. So what you're, uh, what you're doing is, uh, is creating something that you see actually within the browser, and it makes it so that it's cross-platform. Cross uh, it is a, quite an advanced tool, so I'll, I'll leave you um, just with the warning that Touch Develop uses this text-based programming language. It's a bit visual, it's a bit text, it's a mix of the two, but it shouldn't be used with students who haven't seen um, text-based programming languages before. So it's, uh, it's quite an advanced tool, and it was developed not for education. Uh, it's used in education, but it wasn't developed specifically for classrooms. Uh, so Touch Develop, um, also an interesting alternative. Uh, the third thing that I wanted to mention before I very quickly go into tools aimed at younger children is Pocket Code. Pocket Code, unlike the other two tools, unlike App Inventor and Touch Develop, is actually programmed on the smartphone or on the tablet. You can see in the image here, uh, it's a bit small, but on the, the smartphone, on the left side of the image, is a list of instructions that look a lot like Scratch. Well, really, it is very, very similar to Scratch. It was made to be the mobile version of Scratch. It was developed for schools in close communication with the people who made Scratch so that you could program a Scratch game or a Scratch animation on the phone itself. And it's very well designed to be able to do that. Uh, it's, a very, uh, it's a very nice tool. I suggest um, everyone have a look at Pocket Code. It's a free app for Android devices only, unfortunately. Uh, a lot of people have, um, you know, a lot of schools now are getting, are getting iPhones uh, and, um, and iPads, uh, but uh, a lot of these tools are designed for Android for the reason that the platform is more, more open. So Pocket Code uh, is like Scratch for mobile devices. And in fact, you can take a Scratch program now and export it to Pocket Code and see your Scratch game, your Scratch animation on, on a mobile phone using, using Pocket Code. Uh, I will go through a couple of options for younger kids before we finish and take questions. Um, a lot of what we've been talking about is programming intensive, and some teachers um, are in situations either with younger children or in classes that are subject classes, not computing classes necessarily. They need options that have less code uh, or are more appropriate for younger kids. So uh, let's start with one that's appropriate for much younger kids. This is Scratch Junior. The Scratch Junior is a, uh, is an, a tablet app that you can download on most most platforms, iPads and Android devices. And with Scratch, you can create games for your tablet, little apps for your tablet using a kind of a minimized version, a reduced version of, uh, of Scratch. There's a lot of things you can do to teach kids programming on a tablet, but this is actually an app to make apps. So I mention it alongside App Inventor and the others because it's not a game that teaches programming, it's an app that allows children to, to make apps. Um, so, Scratch Junior uh, is an interesting option for very young children. It won't go very well for, um, for older kids. Uh, there is an option, however, to program without code and make, and make apps, uh, which is Wix. Wix is a quite well-known now a website maker that you can make a website without any programming at all, just by pointing and clicking and choosing layouts and color schemes. Um, and Wix allows you not just to make a website, but allows you to make a mobile version of your website. And then it allows you to customize the look of your mobile site. Uh, and so it becomes a lot like making an app. Uh, it's very easy to use. It's very colorful. It's very nice. It's free. And uh, it's a very nice option in, uh, in classes where uh, no programming um, is, is required, and you can, um, uh, you can just use the mouse to, uh, to make these websites in, in Wix. Um, it's, um, 
6.34 and we're about 30 minutes in, so I will just um, bring this to a very quick close uh, by talking about um, a program that uh, that's quite, um, quite popular in the UK now as an example of what people are doing and maybe what the future has in store for schools everywhere in Europe. Uh, this is Apps for Good. And uh, unfortunately on the slide, the, um, the image didn't come through, but it's a pretty picture of a large group of kids receiving awards for apps they designed with this, um, this a, a initiative that has been put in place in the UK to teach kids designing uh, starting just uh, with pen and paper uh, without, a, without a computer, uh, designing apps, and then uh, collaborating with a partner from a technology company. So this is an industry partner that goes into the classroom. In this image, you can see a group of students, a teacher on the left, and a person from, from industry uh, standing behind them who's helped them walk through the app creation process and um, then present their apps. It's something that appeals to boys and girls equally, obviously, apps. And um, Apps for Good, uh, this, this initiative, uh, help students make their apps good enough to then put them on the on the app store. Uh, so apps uh, help you accomplish, I think, a lot of the things that we talked about last week in uh, in our CS course, uh, which is collaboration, making use of um, of design ideas uh, and concepts without actually having computers, um, and then inclusiveness finding projects that are interesting to both uh, girls and boys, which is something very easy to do with apps. Uh, so I'll hand this back to Nair. That's, uh, I'm, done, uh, I'm done presenting, and I'm happy to take uh, questions in the chat. Okay, thank you very much, Patrick, for this great presentation. It has been really useful, I guess, for the teachers. A lot of interesting stuff going on, even for younger students. So now I have my colleagues have helped me to collect the, uh, I've got a couple of questions to ask you. So you just mentioned this Google grants so as to get free phones, and everybody wants to know if there is a link or some somewhere that they can go to apply for them. Yes. So um, I will give you two links uh, if I can get a hold of them. The first link is. Um, is one that I should have included when I, um, I showed you a slide uh, and made reference to flashcards that are very useful for App Inventor. The second link is a link to the program uh, for people interested in getting a grant from Google to do activities during EU Code Week in October. So okay. you have two links here. The can you the links? Okay, no. Oh, sorry. Let me. Um, okay. I sent, I sent the message privately. Let me let me it's do it again. Okay. It's okay. We we can send it to everybody. Okay. Now we okay. got it. Okay. I think thank it should you. come through to everybody now. Okay. Thanks. Thank thank you very much. Uh, Dan, he was also asking if Wix is as easily to use as Weebly. Yes. Yeah, Wix and Weebly are often uh, used um, interchangeably. People go from one to the other. I like Wix. I have never used Weebly, but I hear that it's almost the same thing. Okay, and um, we've got a question also from uh, Karina. Who is, uh, she's saying that they use iPad in their school, and if they can use App Inventor with iPad. Unfortunately not. Um, App Inventor used to be called Google App Inventor, and so it has roots in Android, but that's not the reason they made it for Android. The reason they made it for Android is because it's very hard for students to make apps for uh, iOS devices because it's a closed system. Okay. And we've got another question from Dan, who is asking if there is a possibility uh, either Scratch or others so as to create their own images by using an animation or game. So um, there, there's lots of image editing options in Scratch, but I'm going to need I'm going to need you to rephrase the question because okay. uh, it wasn't 100% clear. 
I think he, he, he wants to know if he can create uh, their, their own images uh, so as to use them in an animation or in a game. But yes, you can import that's, that's images. You can import images into Scratch from from outside of Scratch uh, in PNG, JPEG, or GIF format, the standard image formats. Uh, okay, I don't know if uh, this answers your question, Dan. If not, just feel free to to rephrase the question, please. Okay. Uh, yeah, we've got another question from Evla Desco, <laughs> who is asking if uh, we can export a work from scratch to Pocket Code. Okay, there I have to be 100% honest with you and tell you that I've never done it, but uh, okay. uh, but it it can be done by all accounts. Uh, there is um, uh, a website for Pocket Code. It was developed in Germany for teachers and to give people the ability to use mobile devices to do things that they weren't able to do uh, in Scratch. So one of the things you can do is control hardware with it. You can control specific robot that they've designed it to work with, and you can take your Scratch projects, export them to Pocket Code, and view them in, in Pocket Code. I don't know if that means all Scratch pro projects. Uh, maybe there are some restrictions as to what you can do, but it should be easy enough for you to, to, uh, to Google and find out how to do that because it's part of what makes Pocket Code you know, attractive. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Also, we got another question from Ramasan, who is wondering if there are any good samples to be able to inspire the teachers so as to create new apps. Uh, examples of good apps? Mm, yes. So, in App Inventor, uh, there is a gallery of apps. Uh, the website for App Inventor is quite detailed and there are a lot of uh, lesson plans, a lot of teacher resources. Uh, it's a bit like Scratch. It's a very big community that uses App Inventor and so there's a lot of very good teaching resources. Could Sometimes the problem is there's too many choices um, and so you have to sift through bad apps to see good apps. <laughs> okay. Uh, but um, uh, as I answer other questions, let me um, think of some links I could post to the chat. Okay, I, I, be, I believe Maria Elena was also asking about uh, the link of so as to join App Inventor. I don't know if, if you can if you can write it down so that oh, they can have it. The URL for App Inventor, yes. I think, yeah. I'm writing it now. Great. So it's a website. Everything happens online with App Inventor. It's okay. very easy to to Google it and find it. Great. Okay. So I don't know if there are any other questions that you want to ask Patrick. Can you all see the link to um, App Inventor? Yes. Okay. So is there any other questions that, that you would like to ask Patrick now? No? Okay, go for it. <laughs> sure. So hello Patrick, here's Tommaso. It's um it's a question about the because many many teachers are asking if how they can get free tablets or smartphone, but earlier you were mentioning that uh, it could be a good opportunity also to use tablets and the smartphones the kids have already. Uh, what's your view on that? How can that be managed by teachers? Do you think it's hard then to keep them, you know, behave in the classroom or it's actually a good way to make them also responsible on the use of the, of the devices, for instance? Uh, in my experience, Students have been so responsive to making apps that um, they they're engaged and they're and and they're working. I have to police them a little bit because with the phones I give them, they're actually able to go into the app store quickly, download games, and put them on the phones. Even though I've deleted all games from the phone, <laughs> so when they have their own phones, they probably will need to be policed even more closely. But 
Uh, I think that um, the tool is interesting enough that um, uh, it won't be as much of a problem as when you're using other technologies where the kids can easily switch over into another tab on the browser and be doing something else. Uh, when I do activities using Minecraft and we do programming with Minecraft, the students start playing Minecraft instead of, instead of programming. Uh, so I find that with, um, even with, an, with a mobile device in their hand, it's easier to police them uh, when they're making mobile apps than, uh, than using other technologies. Okay, thank you for the answer, Patrick. I was just trying to let there is another question uh, who, which is, has been posted right now. Um, Dan is asking how many students are there in your classroom uh, for this classroom with, uh, with coding tools? So, um, I, um, I worked in classrooms uh, and in programming clubs, after school clubs and weekend clubs. In classrooms, um, the number was uh, 15 to 25, and in programming clubs, we've worked with as many as 35 uh, students. Uh, in the classroom, we always have two teachers, and in programming clubs, we have up to three or, or four adults uh, who are doing the, the coaching. Okay, and um, Julian is also asking, how do you evaluate this kind of project? So assessment uh, is always difficult with um, work that is either too creative, uh, where everybody is doing something different, or, uh, or work that is uh, everybody is doing the same exact app and ending up at the same endpoint. Um, I think that um, the best way to, for teachers to learn how to assess programming work is using the Scratch curriculum, the official one that's developed by MIT. I'll put a, a URL in a second. And in the Scratch curriculum, uh, I think there's lessons for teachers of all technologies, not just Scratch, all tools, um, on how to assess uh, projects that involve creative computing. Creative computing being the word that I use uh, to talk about the way programming is done with Scratch, App Inventor, um, Lego, Mindstorm robots, uh, creating websites. So I will put um, a link in one second to, uh, to the Scratch um, uh, curriculum, which talks a lot about assessment. And I think that's the best place for teachers to start. Great. Thank you, Patrick. Okay. I think Julian is also asking, uh, which is which is the best subject for us to introduce computing programming in primary school? The best subjects? Can you repeat that? Yeah. Which is uh, which one do you think is the best subject for us to introduce computing in primary school to primary children? Well, um, ironically, I think that the teachers who should be most excited about these creative computing tools are are art teachers, because so many art and music teachers, really, because so many of the things that you can do uh, involve uh, digital art and interactions with, with sprites and with, and with images, creating animations, uh, creating um, uh, images that, um, that, that seem to, uh, to move, to change, to change colors, um, mu visual music uh, apps, where the rhythms of the music um, determine the, um, the motion of the graphics. So I think so much of this is now visual and graphical and auditory, sound oriented, that, um, that music and, and art teachers should be the most excited about this. But of course, there's other, there's other subjects too. I think that language teachers use uh, Scratch to do a lot of dialogues. And storytelling, yes. Storytelling. Um, obviously, anybody who's uh, um, math or logic, um, who's teaching something that's math or logic oriented, uh, is going to be able to make good use of uh, of, of programming and algorithms. Um, okay, great. Um, there is another question also. Uh, somebody wants to know how to if uh, App Inventor can be used without writing code code at all. App Inventor, no. Um, there's um, 
there's nothing exciting you can do with App Inventor except just display an image without, uh, without writing some code. A, think of it as Scratch. There's really nothing you can do in Scratch without taking one little block of code and dragging it onto the editor. Uh, if you're not willing to do that, you can't do much. Okay, and uh, there is another question related to App Inventor. Uh, which textual language does App Inventor's language look like most? Um, App Inventor w is based on, on Google Blockly. Google Blockly is not a, a language but a tool for programmers to develop um, educational things like Scratch. All the, the hour of code activities were developed using Google Blockly. Uh, so that's what Scratch is. I'm sorry, that was, that's what MIT App Inventor is okay. behind, uh, kind of behind the scenes it's using Google Blockly, but it, it looks a lot like Scratch. Okay, um, there is another question. Um, if my students create apps, can they share those apps with everyone? Yes, absolutely. They can, they can put them on the website uh, or they can save them in a, um, a file on a thumb drive and put the thumb drive in the other person's computer or they can create a, um, a file that they actually upload to the Google Play Store, and that turns the app into a real app that everybody in the world who has an Android device can download. So there are multiple ways to share. Okay, great. Um, let me quickly say that I put in a link to the the Scratch Education yeah, website, mm -hmm. yeah, which is something developed at Harvard, and there's um, a curriculum in there that should really help with us using. Um, uh, Scratch and also App Inventor, why not, to, to assess work uh, of students. Okay. I don't know if somebody else was going to ask uh, any other question to Patrick. Just, no, I would like to ask something. Uh, meanwhile, if there is somebody who wants to ask something. I was, I was having lunch with some friends the other day and they have this four-year-old girl who was all the time playing with, uh, with her phone with her mom's phone. So I was talking to them and telling them how valuable technology is nowadays and they were saying that it is really like a lot that they use, uh, that uh, her daughter, her daughter uh, was using the phone too much, like all the time. So I, I just think that they felt overwhelmed with, with, with technology. What would you say to these parents? Like if they feel that their children use technology too much? Yeah, so it's it's a it's a common you know misconception that when we teach kids to to use technology and do programming and do coding activities, we're encouraging their use of these devices. Obviously, they spend way too much time in front of a screen, mm -hmm. and I think um, kids need to be severely limited because most of what they do uh, is going to limit their imagination and not and not. Encourage it. However, if the parents have time to uh, um, supervise what their children are doing or put in some kind of a system to limit their kids' use of the devices for certain things, uh, then then I think um, you know that's what I would recommend to to parents: limit the use of uh, of their devices. Um, and try and find things that uh, are interesting and that they're learning from. Uh, but overall, cap it at you know, a certain amount of time every day, maybe not even every day in front of the screens. Absolutely. Okay, thanks. Patrick, we've got another question from Crystal, who is asking if you can use Pocket Code and Scratch in Dutch. Scratch Junior, sorry. In Dutch. So I don't think that Pocket Code um, is in any other language but English. I was surprised by this because it was developed in Germany and it's used in Germany. Uh, but I think that uh, it's in English only. Now, perhaps I'm wrong. Perhaps if you, if you go to the App Store for your country, then the version that comes down is the version for that, for that language. But, um, but I was only finding the English version. For Scratch Junior, I believe Scratch Junior is in multiple languages, yes. 
Okay. Uh, okay, and there is uh, Dalibor is asking, uh, saying that in Serbia, the Serbian education authorities think that in sixth grade, primary students are supposed to learn programming in Visual Basic, C. And what do you think about it? Uh, sixth grade primary students are 12 years old, I believe. Uh, Twelve-year-olds learning Visual Basic, C++, and C Sharp. Why not as long as the programs they're being asked to write uh, are at their level? I mean, there did not used to be any nice visual programming tools until recently, and all students who wanted to learn programming had to learn with languages like BASIC and uh, uh, things like that. So. We, um, uh, if if those are the languages that they're making available to the kids, then why not? As long as the the programs are are at their level. Unfortunately, it's more boring that way, because uh, ever since the 70s, they've been developing visual uh, tools for kids. The first one that came around was Logo, uh, and um, Logo had was the inventor of the turtle and you made the turtle move right, left, and draw shapes of, of things, and it was much more fun for kids, and they learned the same concepts than when they programmed in BASIC. Okay. And which program, which coding program do you think is appropriate for children age seven? Uh, children age seven, yeah. Scratch. Scratch Junior, you know, actually. Yes, uh, Scratch, Scratch Junior. Okay. Uh, there's lots of um, mini um, mini tools um, in on the Hour of Code website, uh, on the App Store for iOS and Android. There's a, a thing called My Robot Friend, which is uh, which is very nice. Um, there uh, there are lots of tools for for children that age. Okay. I don't know if there are any other questions. No, not for the moment. So, I I think that we yeah it's seven already. So we I think we can finish here. Thank you very much for for being here, Patrick, today with us and sharing this presentation, which has been really useful, I guess, for teachers and also very inspiring. And um, thank you all for joining this webinar on mobile apps. We hope you you have enjoyed and and learn a lot with us. And it has been really nice seeing a lot of teachers learning and working together. So we just encourage you to keep up the, the good work and the MOOCs and keep posted to, to, the, to the courses that we will have in 2016. Thank you a lot and have a nice evening. Thank you, Nair. Thank you, Patrick.